Amongst various people you may find at Tankfest, you would find this bloke here. He goes by the name of Bismarck. I'm told it's not actually his real name. I, I, I don't know. Could you actually find somebody in Germany his real his actual name is Bismarck? Probably not anymore. No. <laughs> Except for our, our royalty that still exists, but for the rest, no. No. All right. So uh, Bismarck runs the Military Aviation History Channel. So if you recall, a couple of weeks ago we did a sort of a joint production. He talked about how hard it was for aircraft to kill tanks, and I talked about how hard it was for tanks to avoid getting killed by aircraft. Are actually relatively easy, given that aircraft couldn't kill tanks. So we have uh, found the most appropriate vehicle to stand in front of because it seems to be the only anti-aircraft vehicle here, pretty much. So what are you doing here anyway, Tank Fest? Well, uh, I'm trying very hard to make up for the lack of aviation. <laughs> that's, that's what I'm trying to do here. I've been failing so far, but at least now we can talk about aircraft and anti-aircraft guns and their usage in, uh, in war. Yeah, because uh, the people that run Tankfest think he's important. They, they gave him a signing uh, time that he had sitting down there waiting for people to come up fans and he could sign on. I didn't have a signing time. Granted, I didn't tell him I was coming either, but that, that might have might something have to do with it. Small, small reason why you right. quite didn't So this wonderful piece of anti-aircraft equipment, the M16 MGMC. So how far up to speed are you on the anti-aircraft artillery units of the various forces? Uh, I don't know about that much. I know they are designed to shoot the aircraft down, or at least keep them away, rather. Um, but for the rest, I'm not familiar with most of these specs here. All right. So obviously built on the American half-track chassis. They actually didn't build as many half-tracks as I thought they were going to initially. It was, I think 16,000. But it's a very simple design, but very rugged design. So it's driven rear, and you can drive the front. Mounted on top, four caliber 50s. So the caliber 50 was, of course, the standard aircraft-mounted weapon for U.S. fighters. Right. Why did the Americans go with the caliber 50 so much compared to nobody else? I mean, it, it was available to, let's say, the British could buy it if they wanted to make caliber 50s uh, on their aircraft. Why didn't they? Um, well, it's, it's a question of what do you need to get the job done. For the Germans, for example, they went with a higher caliber simply because they had to shoot down bombers. Whereas with the Americans and the Brits, in a way, although they did standardize with the, the Hispanos as well, uh, the 50 would be enough to take down German fighters and also medium bombers. The Germans never had something like the B-17 or the B-24 that could actually take the amount of punishment that the American bombers had to take. Uh, but the British just take, kept with the 303. Yeah, but the 303 is just a little bit less uh, than than you would actually need in that case. I mean, we have accounts from the Battle of Britain where the, I think the RAF uh, gave this kind of approximation that they would need 300 rounds of 303 to shoot down a Heinkel. Um, that is not the case. That's actually not bad. Well, that's what they thought it was, but later on it turned out that is not, absolutely not the case. And, <laughs> and they, they, they went more. with the cannons, and, and obviously a cannon is very good, it gets the job done. You don't have that much armor, so you've got to be a good shot right. to get it to work. And with the American planes, if you had a lot of 50s, you had 8 or 6 on them, uh, you could just... Have somebody, somebody walk right in front of you, but go on. Well, yeah, you could just hose uh, an aircraft down. Yeah. and uh, get that shotgun kind of effect. And it was really, really good, these 50s on, on the American aircraft. All right. So what was the standard loader? Was it AP? Was it HEI? API? API, API was standard. Yeah. And uh, was that similar for, let's say, the cannon arms? Um, you mean the, the uh, German cannons? German, German or British cannon, the, uh, the Royal Cons? The, the Americans, with the, uh, excuse me, the, the Brits with the Hispano did have uh, an APHE. Um, so it had a little bit of more punch. Then we do have... The German. Occupational hazard, lads. <laughs> the, and the Germans went uh, full on HE. So they had the mine shell, uh, had a small delay, mm -hmm. fast impact. It would get a really nice effect once it actually hits the aircraft, especially on a, on a 90 degree angle. So with, with, the air, with the guns optimized, let's say, for bomber duty, uh, what was the... Uh, how effective was it for ground attack as well? I mean, I presume if they saw an American tank unit, they'd try to shoot at it. They would, um, since most of the loadout but was actually in fact made for, for bombers, the, the HE obviously wouldn't do much against a tank. Um, would do something against soft targets and um, occupational hazard once again. You, you, you see, this is tank fest, there are many thousands of people here and it's unavoidable. So, um, But for the rest, the Germans did have dedicated 30mm uh, cannons and dedicated ammo. Especially we see this in the ground attackers like the Duck, the Hensha 129, um, that does have uh, armor penetrating rounds with tungsten, uh, tungsten yeah. cores and so on. So, so of course, at, at the high end, you had the, the 129 with a 75mm underneath. Yes. 
I mean, so well, like six rounds or seven rounds. Yeah, it's it's a big gun. It's very impressive on a picture. It's very impressive on on a paper. But actually hitting something with that, it's it's the same with the um, the the ME two six two that they gave the fifty mil. They yeah. Built one of those, and everybody goes crazy. Oh, you know, you can one shot a an enemy aircraft, but actually to get into gun range and actually reliably shoot somebody down, you might as well just take the thirties. Yeah. Okay. Fair enough. So, would, were the was there much of the 129s on the Western Front? I mean, would the M16 like this have encountered many of those, or no? They they were mainly on the Russian front. All okay, right. So, what did American anti-aircraft crews shoot at, other that's, than infantry? That's a good question because if you ask the Wehrmacht, they would probably say nothing because they didn't really see any or look for presence. Um, for the for the ground attackers in in the West, it was mainly uh, fighter bombers. So we're talking about uh, Focke-Wolf 190s and sometimes Messerschmitts. And obviously we see this big push during Operation Bodenplatte, where the Germans try to surprise the Americans. They do succeed, but they also surprise their own anti-aircraft guns and crews <laughs> and have horrendous losses there. Um, and you, you could actually make the argument that, that Operation Bodenplatte is essentially what you know, broke the Luftwaffe in the end. Yeah. So I, I guess the reason you say that is that the Germans had a lot of practice of shooting at airplanes and you know an American gunner here uh, an American gunner here probably had no practice at all of shooting in airplanes because until Buttonblatt he had nothing to shoot at. Yeah, it, I think it's extremely rare for, for the Americans to actually run into German aircraft. Um, there was a little bit of night bombing done by the Germans, uh, but if you only look at the, the sorties flown during uh, D-Day, mm -hmm. I think the Luftwaffe flew about 300 sorties compared to the twelve to 14,000 sorties the Allies flew. <laughs> so there is a little bit of a discrepancy there in the amount of firepower you can actually put onto the table. Okay, so with the with the question of um, uh, with the question of, of of the numbers of sorties, so something I've noticed in the tank world is people will always often celebrate individual tankers. Like right. person A killed two hundred and fifty tanks of the enemy, and person B killed one hundred and forty tanks of the enemy. My personal theory is that the reason the Germans had such high hill count kill counts isn't because they were particularly good, but because they had that many people to shoot at. If an, Amer if an American soldier saw 14 enemy tanks in this entire war, let alone 140, he would be very, very unlucky. Yes. So can I assume that this is a similar thing for the aircraft as well? Uh, I, I would say it's a little bit complex, but that's part of the reason, yes. Um, the, w when you look at the, the amount of missions also flown by German aircraft pilots, like Rudel, for example, um, you, you do see a, a, a real discrepancy between what the Allies had to do, which were obviously rotated, and then the Luftwaffe pilots who were on call 24-7 pretty much. Yeah. And yet yeah, we always had something to shoot at. And that obviously inflates the kill count and the, the potential of a high kill count quite a lot. By, quite a lot. Mm. All right. So is the, do you know? Excuse me, last. You, <laughs> you perfectly stopped, mate. <laughs> Um, so the oh, camp, camp. Now I've been put out. Now I can't remember what I was going to talk about. We talked about the kill counts. We're talking kill counts, and then we're going to go back to anti-aircraft systems. Um, in, in your research, have, do you do you focus on the aviation or Luftwaffe? Because of course, Luftwaffe also had ground troops, they had anti-aircraft troops, they had uh, Fallschirmjäger. What, what's your area Mainly there? Aviation. Mainly aviation. I'm so. trying to go a little bit more diverse. Also, get the aircraft, anti-aircraft batteries in there. Um, simply because it's interesting, obviously, to, to see you know, ground-based uh, units that actually can shoot down the aircraft, which is part of aviation in yeah. a sense. So do you have any sense as to how many flak guns were out there? I mean, all the way from 2 centimeters to 128. Uh, if, you're on a, if you're on a mission, especially as a fighter bomber, yeah. let's say a P-47 or a Mosquito, just how much German flak is coming up at you? It depends where you go. Uh, if you're attacking an airfield, there's a good chance that you'll run into a lot of 20 mil. Um, as for the bomber crews, we obviously know that the, you have all these pictures and these film reels from the time that when the bomber crews went into uh, over the Reich, yeah. you have these huge flak batteries. And the Germans got really good with their flak as well with their 88s. Um, they had probably at the end of the war the, the best flak um, or AA anti-aircraft defense system uh, in the world. Um, although obviously practice makes perfect. And yeah, they had, yeah. <laughs> they had lots, lots of yeah. practice and opportunity as well. All right, so what else do we want to talk about while we're sitting here at tank fest with lots of armor and no armored vehicle flying tanks Sturmovic, oh. yeah hind anything else um with the Sturmovic, it's an interesting thing i once made a video um that, that essentially 
talked about the amount of armor that aircraft actually has. Mm -hmm. And obviously, armor is extremely heavy. Mm -hmm. You don't put a lot of into it in, in the aircraft, even though there is this perception that um, you know there's certain aircraft out there that are extremely well armored. B-17 comes to mind, although that's more structural integrity than actually armor. Um, the P-47, that's mm -hmm. a Thunderbolt, of course. Yeah. Um, people talk about you know the amount of punishment it can take. Uh, not a lot of armor. With the Stormerwick, of course, you have a lot of armor. Um, the pilot essentially sits in a bathtub, and it's up to roughly up to eight to ten millimeters, depending on the variant. Um, which so, what what is ten millimeters going to actually stop? I Man, I think ten millimeters of armor on a tank, and that's nothing. It'll stop a machine gun. Yeah. Maybe it might stop a machine gun. Most armor during World War II, um, conceptually, is good against low and heavy machine guns. At, at the ranges that we're talking about, you also have uh, some protection against cannons, especially when we talk about HD rounds. Um, however, you also have to think about if, if a bullet actually, or a shell, hits an aircraft, traverses through it, it's going to lose some of its inertia, I guess, mm -hmm. or kinetic energy, yep. I guess is the best, best word. You're the expert here. Um, and then hitting the armor plate, it, it might absorb a little bit. Um, but overall, the aim for any pilot is always, don't get hit. <laughs> That's simply how it is. Uh, in fairness, tankers, we try to rely on that technique as well. Yeah. So sort of the, the armor is a saving throw. You, you screwed up, can you survive with the saving throw? Exactly. Yeah. Why didn't Western Aviation get into the the dedicated ground attack aircraft? I mean, mo pretty much everything that you come up with is a modified fighter. That yes. Okay, we'll throw bombs on it and see what happens. Um, good question. So, with the Germans, uh, we do, do see a, a strong focus on tactical early on with the Stukas. And, uh, and and so forth. With, with the RAF, for example, uh, they don't really have a dedicated ground attacker until very, very late. Uh, you could say maybe the Typhoon is one. And you, you do have, in 1940, you do have some desperate attempts um, to make something happen with the uh, amount of stuff they have. Yeah. Um, but it, it, it isn't really something that, that crossed their minds, I guess. Uh, for dedicated ground attackers, we, we do see in the First World War how effective it can be in small dosages. Mm -hmm. um, but I think the true potential really was only unlocked during World War II, and that's when most countries actually realized it. And I think then it's also a case of what do you actually need to get the job done. With the Germans, especially on the Eastern Front, you need something that can fight tanks. So they take the Stuka, they put the gun pods on. Uh, the same thing with the, with the Henschel 129. Uh, you need something to actually destroy armor. With the Allies, they can get around that. They can, we, we have obviously talked about this a little bit in, in the collaboration video. Yeah. Right? Um, so if you do sh shoot rockets and bombs or drop bombs on, on tanks, the amount, the chances you have to actually score a hit is very low. But if you take out the support col columns, if you take out the soft targets and so on, the, tar the, the tanks are not going to go very far without any... Can you, can you keep moving at all? You're <laughs> Thanks. But yeah, the tanks are not going to go very far without the supporting infrastructure that actually keeps them going. Yeah. And the Allies did very good use well, can, of Can't you make the same argument on the Eastern Front? Well, in the Eastern Front, we, we see very little introduction, actually, uh, on both the German and the, and the Soviet side. The Soviets, for about 80 to 90 percent of all their air missions, gun attack missions, were in 10 kilometers of the front lines. They always dedicated their, their strike aircraft on what's actually going on on the front lines. So it's a very different picture to what we have in the, uh, in the, uh, in the West. Also, at least that's uh, in part my theory, is because in the East, uh, the Germans were able to get local air superiority for quite some time, mm -hmm. um, at least temporary for a couple of hours sometimes, and they could engage these, these interdiction strikes that went in far into into um, into uh, German territory uh, if they wanted to. On the West, the Allies reigned supreme in the, in the sky, mm -hmm. especially after Normandy and especially after Bodenplatte, and uh, they could just unleash on whatever they wanted. Uh, fly wherever, and exactly. okay, fair enough. All right, so what else? Anything? Um, well, my question would be this vehicle right here. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Sorry, could you just... We're recording. Thanks. Um, we, we talked about how the Luftwaffe doesn't really have a presence in France. Yes. And on Egalis. What did they actually use this then for? We're very good against infantry. Oh, I imagine so. I mean, one caliber 50 is good. Four caliber 50 is better. Right. <laughs> there was a twin caliber 50 version of it, the M15 uh, multiple gun motor carriage. Uh, the in the Korean War as well, these things were very useful. They uh, uh, they were used again against especially the Chinese waves, yes. and they would often be in mixed units. So there was another version, yet another version of this, which had a 37 millimeter uh, automatic gun, or may, may later there may have been a 40. I can't recall, but definitely a 37. Yeah. And I think it also had two caliber 50s as well. 
So between the quad and the 37, you could put quite a devastating uh, rate of fire right. against an infantry unit, even if it was in a building, you know, usually a wooden building of the area. So that would be quite useful. Um, there was also a use later on. So by the time you get to the Vietnam era, you get the, the gun truck era. So okay. the, the idea behind this was you'd, you'd mount machine guns and armor onto a five-ton truck, or a deuce and a half truck. And it will be used for convoy escort. You'd be driving up and down with this thing. So it would not be impossible to find one of these quad 50s mounted on the flatbed of a truck that was being used to escort convoys uh, and, again, uh, be quite nasty. Now, in Iraq, we did discover gun trucks were being brought back into service or somebody either invented them separately or realized, oh, we did this before, 40 years ago. <laughs> Maybe we should try it again because it worked back then. Uh, but I've never seen a an AA mount used. No, there was one exception. The Avenger anti-aircraft vehicle, the thing that's based off of a Humvee with a Stingers and yes. a It has Since it has a good FLIR system and it has a caliber 50 rifle, uh, machine gun, right. what it's supposed to do, I don't know, but it has one. Uh, they realize this is great for convoy escort because it's a Humvee, it's fast, mm -hmm. it's cheap to run, it's got a great optic so you can see people hiding in ambush, and you got a caliber 50. So the Avenger guys were more doing convoy escorts than they were doing uh, anything to do with aviation because, you know, obviously outside of maybe a drone, there's no aviation to shoot at. Right. Excellent. So yeah, you make use of what you have, essentially. And you, you go into war you thinking that you're going to run into a lot of planes, I guess. And then you realize, actually, Luftwaffe isn't there. Let's just hose down a building. Well, again, you look at the reports from early North, the early American uh, interactions in North Africa. And there was a lot of emphasis on uh, the early reports coming back. We need more anti-aircraft artillery uh, or anti-aircraft firepower. Yeah. Now, it could be just put caliber 50s on everything, which well, we ended up doing. Mm -hmm. Or it would be uh, add uh, anti-aircraft to the units. So, for example, the, tank, the original tank destroyer battalion, it's actually had an anti-aircraft company, as I recall correctly. Okay. Which you'd think was a bit weird, but I, I guess they figured that when the Germans were swarming around the battlefield with their massed units supported by Stukas, when the tank destroyer battalion met the incoming panzers, well, the panzers would have the Stukas, so the tank destroyers needed to have something to shoot the Stukas down, or at least make them go away. That's, not necessarily the shoot them down. But, hey, go away, shoot them down, same difference uh, to the tank uh, tank destroyer crew or what have you. That's actually a good point, because that's, that's obviously the point you made in your video, is um, anti-aircraft guns are not just there to shoot something down, they're just made as well to yeah. just keep the enemy at bay or yeah. to make him drop early his ordnance early yeah. and so on it's air um, defense not air destruction exactly um one of the things that you could actually say is the similar similar is in aviation uh, turrets and defensive armament on bombers mm -hmm. um, if you don't put any defensive armament on bombers well the bomber is going to get shut down very very easily yes um if you put just one gun on there that already might help a little bit especially against an inexperienced fighter pilot coming in mm -hmm. um, but if you put a lot of guns on there and the Americans and there's a lot of tracer coming at you there's a lot of tracer coming at you it's it's nerve wracking it's not very fun to fly into it and you can hear those even if it's just one or two hits you can hear those mm -hmm. on any aircraft and it's not a fun experience and in, in that sense the turrets even though nowadays we often focus on kill counts you know, how many fighters did the Americans shoot down and yeah, so on yeah. um, on the bombers it's more so keep those fighters away let the escorts handle it and um, just make sure that the bombers get through. Yeah, ultimately, what is the mission? The mission is drop bombs. It's exactly. not to shoot down airplanes. Yeah. If you can do it, then fine. But if you can't, who cares? Especially because the Germans did such a good job of essentially sabotaging themselves with bomb cutter. No. So didn't, you didn't actually really need to shoot them down. <laughs> but yeah, yeah, there we go. So there you go. Don't forget, what is your mission? Don't get distracted by, th by shiny things like medals and whatever. Just, just get the job done and you'll be good. Okay, um, I think we're about done. What's your, as an aviation guy, what's your opinion on tank fest? It's excellent. Um, first time I actually see moving tanks. First time I'm surrounded by so many tanks. And it's absolutely brilliant. I'm very happy to be here. Woo! All right, well, we'll, uh, we'll see what we can do about any other collaborative videos. I'm not sure what comes off the top of my head, but I, I, I think I like this guy. So we'll, we'll see where we go. Thank you very much. All right, so again, this is Bismarck from Military Aviation History YouTube channel. And... Uh, well, we'll see what it comes up with next. Well, thank you very much. See you guys later.